As Corby said earlier, we are starting a new series this week, starting our series on uh, gender and uh, sexuality. We're going to be talking about that topic for the next four weeks. If in the course of uh, these next few weeks you have a question, you can click on this QR code. It'll take you to an email address. You can send in your question. Uh, I'll see if I can work it into the, the sermon series. But also we're going to do uh, two uh, panel discussions, kind of roundtable discussions. The first one's going to be on April 24th in here, probably in the, the overflow room. April 24th, 7, 9 p.m. We'll have some of our staff and a couple local counselors just to kind of interact over the series and over the topic, that kind of thing. So uh, if you have a question that comes up, maybe I can work it into the sermon series or you can uh, bring it and you can talk uh, when we get to the panel itself. Um, you know, this is going to be a, a, a challenging sermon series, but I think really, really critical and important. Um, let me go back here. And if I can kind of frame where we're going, on each of these topics that we get into, I want to discuss what the world is saying, or what's the messaging that we are getting from the world today. And then I want to look at the Word of God. What does the Word of God say about the topic? And then I want us to think together about how we live as people who follow Jesus, and we're in the world, but we're not of the world. And how do we walk and live in both truth and love in the midst of a culture that's moving away from God, and we are standing for God and representing God? So um, I'm going to start this morning with uh, a really simple question. My question is this, who are you? Who are you? What, more broadly, what does it mean to be a human? What does it mean to be a person? And where do you go to answer that question? A lot of times you ask somebody that question, who are you? And they answer with what they do, right? So who are you? Well, I'm, I'm a doctor, I'm a lawyer, I'm a teacher which doesn't answer the question who you are, that is what you do, it's not who you are. Or people will answer with who they're related to. I'm Tristy's husband, I've been Anna Joy's father. Well, that's who I'm related to, it's not who I am. Now increasingly, when you ask somebody that question, who are you, uh, they answer with something that's related to their gender or their sexuality. I am he, him, I am she, her, I am straight, I am gay, I am lesbian, I am trans. It's in my email signature, which represents who I am. And that's where our, our culture has moved. What's interesting to me in the timing of all this is just in this last week, both the Pope and the President have made a statement about who you are. Both the Pope and the President have made statements about human identity and about gender and sexuality. So I ask the question again, where do you go to get the answer? Should you listen to the Pope? Should you listen to the President? Should you listen to your parents? Should you listen to your pastors? Did you get that? Four Ps. <laughs> Worked really hard on that. <laughs> Should you listen to your friends around you? Should you listen to a voice that's speaking very loudly inside of you? How do you define who you are? Where do you go to get the answer for that? Now, throughout the series, I'm going to recommend to you uh, several good resources. Uh, the first one I want to recommend is a book by Nancy Piercy. It's called Love Thy Body. In Nancy Piercy, Love Thy Body. In Nancy Piercy's book, she creates a conceptual framework for how people think of themselves, either consciously or unconsciously. Right? And she speaks of this in, in terms of uh, two floors. The first floor is the worldview of modernism. Okay? It's typically called modernism. It's uh, objective. It's the realm of science, biology, fact. And in modernism, you are your body. And that's it. Matter is everything. And so it's very reductionistic because it doesn't really take into account your thoughts or your feelings or anything like that. Like you may have this experience that you describe as a feeling, but all that it is is a biochemical reaction. You are reduced to just matter. That's all that you are in a modernistic worldview. Now the second floor is what we describe as postmodernism. Postmodernism is the realm of uh, the subjective, it's psychology, theology, morality, ethics, feelings. In modernism, uh, you are your feelings. Right? It's also reductionistic because in a postmodern worldview, your body is irrelevant to who you are. All that matters is how you feel inside, right? So both are reductionistic in terms of what is a person. 
You are your feelings. Whatever your feelings are at any given moment, that is who you are. And since the strongest feelings that any person often has are sexual feelings, you are defined by your sexual feelings and by your attractions. That is who you are. So, this is true for all of us, but uh, I think it's particularly challenging for you students because you really, you, you kind of live in both worlds and you move from day to day, sometimes from hour to hour, from one, from the first story to the second story, from the second story to the first story, right? You go into your finance class or your chemistry class, your biology class, your calculus class, your engineering class, and you are right in the middle of a modernistic worldview. It's, it's facts, it's science. It's objective realities and truth. And then you walk out of that class and you get on Instagram or TikTok or if you're over 30 Facebook (laughs) and you move squarely into a postmodern worldview where everyone defines themselves. And even your professors, they can give a lecture and their worldview is modernism, but then they walk out and they live as if they are postmodern. And you move back and forth between these two, but I would argue that the prevailing uh, cultural attitude, whether consciously or unconsciously, but the prevailing cultural attitude is certainly postmodern. In a postmodern world, you have a right and responsibility to define who you are for yourself. And it's based upon entirely how you think about yourself and how you feel about yourself. And everyone around you has a responsibility to affirm and validate how you think about yourself. And that's how the world thinks these days. So, why are we talking about this in church? Uh, I only say that because I know that some of you are thinking that because you've said that to me. <laughs> why, are we, why are we doing this series anyway? Can't you like squeeze a few more sermons out of Romans? <laughs> and then I've had others who say, you know, I really wish we weren't talking about this, but I'm really glad that we are talking about this because this is the world that we live in right now. So why are we talking about this? Well, um, we, we are a, a Bible church. We're Grace Bible Church, which means that we believe that this is the word of God. Consequently, we believe that it's authoritative over our lives. And if you take the word of God and you open to page one, there's a declaration from God about who you are. God says on page one who you are, and it relates to your gender, sexuality, your body. And what God is saying to us is that he cares about your sexuality. He cares about uh, your thoughts and your feelings and your emotions and your body and your marriage and your friendship. He cares about everything about you because he cares about you. He cares about you and he loves you. And because he made you, he knows how life will work best for you and he wants you to experience the best life you could possibly experience, and that only happens when you live consistently with who God says that you are. So, who does God say that you are? Let's listen to these words from David in Psalm chapter 139. Speaking to God, he says, you formed my inward parts. You wove me in my mother's womb. I will give thanks to you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Who are you? You are a masterpiece of God's design and creation. And he loves you and he cares about you. So specifically, what does it mean to be a person? What does it mean that we are fearfully and wonderfully made? Let's go all the way back to the beginning. We're going to turn back to Genesis chapter 2 and verse 7. Genesis 2 verse 7, it says, The Lord God formed the man from the soil of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and the man became a living being. Okay? The Lord God formed the man from the soil of the ground. That is physical. He made the man a body. And then he breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. That is spiritual. The man was given life from God. And when the life from God entered into his physical being, he became, in Hebrew, it's a nephesh, he became a person. What does it mean to be a person? It means that you are physical and spiritual. You're material and immaterial. You are first floor and second floor united in one person. That's what it means to be a human. You're both and. You're physical and you are spiritual, integrated into one person. Another book that I'm gonna recommend to you Uh, And I'll put these up at the end uh, as well. Sam Albury, What God Has to Say About Your Body. 
Hey, Sam Albury, what God has to say about your body. In this book, he made this comment. He said, God didn't, make, uh, didn't first make a soul called Adam and then look around for something physical to put that soul into. As though the soul was the real Adam and his body was the equivalent of a Tupperware container to store it in. No, God actually started with matter. He made the body first and then he breathed his life into the body. And at that moment, Adam became a person. Or as Carl Truman similarly observed, he said, our bodies are an integral part of who we are. And I do not occupy my body as I might occupy a house or a spacesuit or a deck chair at the beach. On the contrary, it is an integral part of me, inseparable from who I am. Therefore, your body is you and your spirit is you. You're not just a body. You're not just a spirit. You are material and immaterial. And what that means for us is that we were designed by God to actually inhabit two realms simultaneously. Right? We were designed by God to inhabit the physical realm and the spiritual realm simultaneously. Of course, we read this verse earlier. 1 Corinthians 16, it says, Do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God? And you are not your own, for you were bought with a price, therefore glorify God with your body. So are you physical or are you spiritual? Yes, you are both. Do you not know that your body, that God has given you as a gift, is a temple of the Spirit because you are spiritual, whom you have from God. You are not your own. You're bought with a price. Therefore, glorify God, which is a spiritual idea, in your body. You are both physical and spiritual. So you're not just your body, but your body is necessary for who you are and identifying who you are. In other words, there would not have been an Adam without a body. There would not have been an Eve without a body. There's not a you without a body. God's design is that the material and the immaterial are integrated into one person and that there shouldn't be a conflict between the two. That's what it means to be human. So uh, what happened was uh, God began to create. And as he's creating uh, birds in the heaven, animals in the field, and fish in the sea, he gets to the pinnacle of his creation it's man. He creates man. And, and about man, he says something that he doesn't say about anything else that he's created. He says, man is made uh, in his image. Genesis chapter 1, verse 26. Then God said, let us make man in our image according to our likeness. God created man in his own image, in the image of God. He created him male and female. He created them. So what this is saying is that you image God through your body. Your body is an essential component of who you are, of your identity. And you as man, mankind, are the pinnacle of God's beautiful creation and design. And you alone can image him. And you image him in and through your body. Your body's necessary for you to image God on earth. Not only that, your male body or your female body is necessary for you to image God on earth. The image of God was not fully represented on earth until there was male and female created. So what does it mean then specifically to be made in the image of God or to image God? I would argue that this is absolutely one of the most foundational, important theological concepts in the entire body. I'm going to give you four characteristics of what it means to be made in the image of God. The first is this. Because we are in, in the image of God, we can relate to God and to others. We can have a personal relationship with God that bears can't have and fish can't have and gorillas can't have and ants can't have. Because we're made in the image of God, we can have a personal relationship with God. John chapter 17, Jesus said this. This is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. Remember in John 17, Jesus is praying to the Father, but he's wanting his disciples to listen as he prays. And he says, this is life. And when he says eternal life, he's not just talking about life that lasts for a long time. He's talking about something qualitative. That is, he's talking about the life that God possesses. Only God has life in himself, and he can give life to others. Remember when Adam was created, he breathed in him to, into him the breath of life because God has life in himself, and he gave life to Adam. And in John's uh, gospel, that life is described as eternal life. That is, life from God lasts forever because God lasts forever. And he says, this is the nature of life, to be in relationship with God. 
That's what we were designed for. And outside of relationship with God, we're not experiencing life. This is life. Not only life with God, but we're also designed to have life with one another. So, God creates and he says, it's good. Creates the birds, it's good. Creates the plants, it's good. It's good, it's good, it's good. He ends each day saying, it was good. It was good. And then he creates Adam and he starts working with Adam and he says, hmm, not good. Now, Adam's good, but it's not good for Adam to be by himself. Why? Because Adam was designed for relationship. Which, as we'll talk about in a couple weeks, doesn't mean that every single one of us will be married. We can still image God without being married. Jesus never got married. Paul never got married. We can have a, have a rich and full and satisfying, fulfilling life that honors God but we can't, without being married, but we can't without having relationships that are deep and, and significant and transparent with one another. We are made for relationships. So first component of being made in the image of God means that we were made for relationship with God and with others. Second, because we're made in the image of, image of God, we reflect God's glory in our character. Now, uh, the Hebrew word glory, uh, kavod, uh, it literally means something that's heavy or weighty. So Metaphorically, then, it means something that's significant. Uh, one of the ways it was used was, was shorthand to describe God's personality. God's personality is his glory because his glory is perfect. It is weighty. It's heavy. It's important. And so shorthand for biblical writers was the glory of God is the personality of God, all of the perfections of God's personality. And notice, we were made in such a way that we could reflect the perfections of God's personality. We could be like God. Now, anybody uh, trade in your glasses this week for, uh, anybody go look at the, uh, the eclipse? Anybody look at the eclipse? Okay, yeah, like vast majority. Well done. Uh, did any of you drive so that you could be in the path of totality? Okay, nerds. But I will say, I will say, I'm right there with you. Pat, Coyle, and I actually, we, we tried to figure out how we could get into the path of, of totality, but then realized we had a meeting that we, that we couldn't miss uh, legitimately. So, so our staff was, the majority of us, were, we were right outside here. You know, and the, 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 the clouds parted for a minute. We got to see it. It was like, that was really, really, that was really cool, right? So we were at the 98%. We weren't quite in the path of totality. I uh, wish we could have been. Now, so what happened, right, with the eclipse? Uh, World didn't end, that's good. <laughs> Despite what we were told might happen. But what actually happened is the moon came in between the sun and the earth. So what did you experience when the moon came in between the sun and the earth? Not, it's not a trick question. It got dark. <laughs> and and it, actually, the temperature dropped a little bit. Why? Because the moon doesn't have light in itself. Real simple. Now, on a clear night, full moon, the moon is bright. You can go outside and you can see. You can walk around and see things. And it's amazing because it's reflecting the light of the sun. It doesn't have any light in itself. But it can reflect the light of the sun. That is us. We don't have life in ourselves. But when we receive the life of God, we can reflect the beauties and perfections of God's character. And we alone can do that out of all of God's creation. Now, third, because we're in the image of God, we can radiate God's glory in our form. So the word uh, image occurs 17 times in the Old Testament, almost all of those times, I think all of them, but, but two, it refers to a, a literally a physical image or a physical form. So remember when uh, Nebuchadnezzar, he set up an image of himself, and the idea was in his absence, this would represent his beauty. All right, so an image was a form. We image God because we've been given a form and we've been given a form that can actually have the capacity to radiate God's glory or God's beauty. Exodus chapter 34. It came about when Moses was coming down from Mount Sinai that Moses did not know that the skin of his face shone because of his speaking with God. Wow, that's a really weird verse. 
So what happens is Moses is up on the mountain and he's interacting with the glory of God, the beauty of God, and he doesn't realize it, but that glory has become embedded in him. And when he comes down from the mountain, people go, whoa, that's kind of spooky. Could you cover up? Your, your beauty has become frightening to us because we have a form that when we are in proximity to God, we radiate the beauty of God. Another interesting verse, Matthew chapter 17, says, Jesus was transfigured before them and his face shone like the sun and his garments became as white as light. Because he had just been in the presence of his father, his disciples look at him and they know it's Jesus, but there's a beauty that's radiating out from him that they've never experienced before because the son of God had taken on human form, a body, and a body that had the capacity to radiate the very beauty of God. Now, we may say to ourselves, I don't really see that in myself right now. I don't feel that in myself right now. Why? Because there's a separation between us and God. But we're told in the book of Daniel, chapter 12, verse 3, that we will, we will, when we receive our glorified bodies, our beautiful bodies, we will radiate the very beauty of God. It's part of what it means to be made in the image of God. Yeah. Fourth element of the image of God is this. We represent God's purposes or his intentions, his desire, his will on earth. I want you to listen to these words. This is from Psalm chapter 8, verse 3. David writes, when I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have ordained. He's outside and he's just thinking, this is amazing. Your, your creation is, is just stunning. It's beautiful. It's complex. It's vast. When I think about this, I think about myself. And he says, what is man that you even take thought of him? Why do you even stop and think about me? I'm just tiny, a tiny speck in your created universe. What is man that you even take thought of him and the son of man that you care for him? Yet you have made him a little lower than God, and you crown him with glory and majesty. You make him to rule over the works of your hands. I see creation, I think, what am I? I'm just a tiny speck, and yet somehow you've made me just below you. And you've given me the opportunity, the authority to represent you on earth, to represent your will on earth. What is this an echo of? It's an echo of Genesis chapter 1. Be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth and subdue it and rule. That is, represent God's will on earth. Rule over the earth, put things in order, keep things in order, create, create ideas, create music, create beauty, represent God's creative will on earth because you've been made in the image of God. And so what that means is God gave us a form or a body that's appropriate to the realm in which we live. We have a physical body because we live in a physical world so that we can represent God through our bodies in this world that he has created. What that means is it matters how you think about your body and what you do with your body. Because your body is a gift that's been given to you by God so that you can image him on earth. In other words, you are amazing. Okay? Let's write that in your notes if you're taking notes this morning. I am amazing. You are a masterpiece of God's design, made in his image. Now also, you are fatally flawed. You are also deeply broken. I want you to turn to Genesis chapter three. Genesis chapter three, you'll notice we've been in Genesis one and Genesis two, now we're in Genesis three because there's so much that you can understand about who you actually are, your identity in Genesis one, Genesis two, and Genesis three. So Genesis three, verse one. Now the serpent was more crafty than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, indeed has God said, you shall not eat from any tree of the garden. The woman said to the serpent, from the fruit of the trees of the garden we may eat, but from the fruit of the tree which is in the middle of the garden, God has said, you shall not eat from it or touch it or you will die. The serpent said to the woman, you surely will not die. 
For God knows that in the day you eat from it, your eyes will be open and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. When the woman saw that the tree was good for food, that it was a delight to the eyes, that the tree, tree was desirable to make one wise, she took from its fruit and ate. She gave also to her husband with her and he ate. Then the eyes of both of them were opened and they knew that they were naked. They sewed fig leaves together and made themselves loin coverings. They heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day and the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. So uh, what is it that the serpent uh, tries to do? Well, he tries to create a wedge between God and the creatures that are made in the image of God. And what he's tempting Adam and Eve to do is to figure out their life separate from God. That is uh, autonomy, which means uh, self-rule, right? That's the essence of his temptation of them is your life will be better if you live separately from God. The problem is this. We are what's described as contingent beings. We don't actually have life in ourselves. Our life is derived from God. Only God has life in himself. So to live separately from God is death. It is death, which doesn't mean a cessation of existence. Death means separation. It means alienation. And so what did Adam and Eve experience? The moment that they thought we, that they could live autonomously, they could have self-rule, they could experience life apart from God, they didn't experience life, they experienced death. There was an alienation. In every aspect of their being, they experienced alienation. They were alienated from God. They were separated from God. No longer are they joyfully walking with God in the cool of the day in the garden. Instead, they eventually get cast out of the garden. They are away from God. They're alienated from God. They're also alienated from each other. Right? They feel fear and shame with each other. They're hiding from each other. There's an alienation. They feel eventually uh, frustration and anger and jealousy and their kids uh, kill one another. I mean, it's like, whoa. If life is derived from God and you're separated from God, then you're going to be separated from everything. They're alienated from one another. They're alienated from creation that they were designed to, to rule over, to receive its abundance as they exercise their creative authority over it. Instead, now they're alienated from the earth. And so what do they experience? Well, thorns and thistles is the description. That is, work is hard and it's not always rewarding. It's frequently unsatisfying. You can't make quite enough money to get all of your bills paid and set aside money for retirement and pay uh, your, your kids' tuition bills and then inflation starts going up and interest rates rise and you can't afford to buy a house. And just, it's frustrating. You're alienated from earth itself. And you buy a house and you build a house and it's brand new and then it begins to deteriorate. And, you know, and then your air conditioner goes out and then you discover mold in the walls and you gotta tear all the sheetrock off. Why? Because you're alienated from the earth. Alienated from God, alienated from one another, alienated from the earth, also alienated from ourselves. Okay, we're alienated from ourselves. Listen again to verses seven and eight. It says, they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves loin coverings. And the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. Why did they sew fig leaves together specifically and cover their loins? Because they were ashamed of their bodies. They are alienated from themselves. They're alienated from themselves. They experienced death, and they transmitted that death to every single generation. And so the Apostle Paul tells us in Ephesians 2, we're born dead. We're physically alive, but we are alienated. We're born alienated from God. We're born alienated from one another. We have anger and fear with one another and hatred and jealousy and wars with one another. We're alienated from the created universe. Work's always going to be hard at some level for everyone. It's never going to be fully satisfied. But we're also born dead in that we're alienated from ourselves. And so our minds don't reason perfectly. We can reason to the wrong conclusion. Our emotions betray us. They're, they don't always correspond to, to reality. They take over and we, we feel fear and anxiety and depression. Sometimes it's crippling and we don't even want to get out of bed. We, we are alienated from ourselves internally, but then we're also alienated 
from our physical bodies. I've never met a single person who says, perfect, right? <laughs> 10 out of 10. Read them and weep. You only could wish. No, no one ever says that, ever. I'm too fat, I'm too skinny, I'm too tall, I'm too short, I'm too male, I'm too female. I don't fit in my body. That's the result of the brokenness of the fall and sin in the world. Don't be surprised. We live in a broken and fallen world. So the result is this. Our ability to enjoy God, our ability to enjoy each other, our ability to enjoy work, our ability to enjoy ourselves and accept ourselves is diminished because we are broken by sin. That's not the end of the story. We will also be fully restored. Okay? There is hope. You will be fully restored. You'll be fully restored spiritually. You'll be fully restored physically. Okay, spiritually. I'll give you just one illustration. Ezekiel chapter 36. This is the Lord speaking about the day when he sets everything right. And he says, Moreover, I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you, and I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh, and I will give you a heart of flesh. I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes. What was the original problem was that God's spirit became separated from our spirit. We are spiritual beings, and our spirit doesn't function right when it's separated from the spirit of God. But he says, you know what's going to happen is my spirit's going to dwell inside of you again. And when I do that, I'm going to give you a new heart. That is, you are always going to be inclined toward the things that are good and holy and pure and righteous and life-giving, and there won't be anything inside of you that's pulling you away from life. You will be whole spiritually. You will be healed spiritually. There will no longer be an internal conflict. Your will won't be fragile and weak. Your mind will reason perfectly. Your emotions will be corresponding perfectly to reality. And your relationship with me will be whole, complete, healed. Okay, we will be set right spiritually. We will also be set right physically. Romans chapter 8, Paul writes, We ourselves, having the first fruits of the Spirit, grown within ourselves, waiting eagerly for our adoption as sons, the redemption of our body. So what happens the moment that you believe in Jesus Christ for the first time is your debt of sin is removed. So you don't have to pay it. You have to earn God's favor. Your debt's paid. And God's Spirit takes up residence inside of you. And he comes in, and Paul describes it as, it's, it's, he comes in like a down payment. This isn't all that you're going to get. There's more in the future. And he says, now that we have the, the down payment of the Spirit inside of us, we're, we're, we're kind of groaning. Because we realize there's a lot more to come, but we groan. <laughs> because, because this body is just, man, it just doesn't hold up. Right? 2 Corinthians 5, he describes it as a tent. Remember, Paul was a tent maker, and none of his tents lasted. They got holes in them, and moths ate them, and the wind blew them down, and they got torn, whatever. And he goes, you know, now it's like I'm in a tent that just keeps getting blown down, and it keeps falling down. He said, but someday we're going to receive a new tent, and that tent will be imperishable and undefiled. It won't fade away. It'll be whole and healthy. So he says here, what are we waiting for? We're waiting for actually the redemption of our bodies. We won't just be spiritually restored. We will be physically restored. We will receive a body you read in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 that is perfect and will remain perfect forever. It's called a glorified body. So you will be restored. Spiritually, you will be restored. Physically, and you are now being restored. Progressively, sometimes slowly. Spiritually, in the context of your body. Right? In the context of your body, because we live in a physical world, God is Restoring us progressively. Oh, I had one more verse for you, just in case you want this in your notes. Two more. Philippians 3, 20 through 21, 1 John chapter 3. What's that body going to look like? It's going to look like Jesus. The Lord Jesus Christ will transform the body of our humble state into conformity with the body of his glory. So think Mount of Transfiguration, the body of Jesus. That's what we have to look forward to. 1 John chapter 3, verse 2 as well. Now, we are currently, though, being restored spiritually. 2 Corinthians 3, verse 18. 
But we all with unveiled face, beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory, just as from the Lord, the Spirit. Now, do you, do you, did you get all of the uh, Old Testament allusions there? We all with unveiled face. What's he referring to? Moses going into the presence of God, and he pulls back the veil. Because every time Moses went into the presence, he pulled back the veil, then he dropped the veil because the people were kind of freaked out about him glowing. But when he's in the presence of God, it's an unveiled face. He's saying, right now, right now, as we read the word and we think about Jesus and we pray to Jesus and we're around people who reflect Jesus, we are being transformed into the image of glory or the beauty of God and the character of God. Jesus Christ is being formed in us. Progressively, we are becoming more and more and more like the beauty and glory of Jesus because that's what we were designed for because we're made in the image of God. So when the fall happened, the image of God was not erased. It was not destroyed, but it was damaged. And now what is God doing progressively in your life is he's restoring the image of God. Colossians chapter one, verse 15 says, Jesus is the perfect image of God because in bodily form, he is what man was designed to be. And what God is doing presently in your life is he's conforming you, Romans chapter 8, to the image of Jesus Christ. As you listen to the Spirit, as you read the Word and meditate, as you pray, as you are in fellowship with others who are pursuing the same thing, the image of Christ is being formed in you. And all of that is happening in the context of your body. Okay? Sanctification happens in your body because you are bodily. You are not just spirit. You are not just body. You're not just first floor or second floor. You are both integrated into one person. So notice what Paul says in 1 Corinthians 10, verse 31. Whether then you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. Is that verse about your body or is it about your spirit? Yes. <laughs> it's about your spiritual life that happens in your body. Okay, whether you eat or drink, which those are just kind of pretty, pretty basic things that you do every day, or whatever you do, do all in a way that the image of Christ can be formed in you, that is, you can reflect the glory of God. So, for the context of the sermon series, the point is this, your body matters. Your body matters. To God. Now I want you to turn with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 12. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 12. Paul says, All things are lawful for me, but not all things are profitable. All things are lawful for me, but I will not be mastered by anything. Food is for the stomach, and the stomach is for food, but God will do away with both of them. Yet the body is not for immorality, but for the Lord, and the Lord is for the body. Now God has not only raised the Lord, but will also raise us up through his power. Do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ? What's his point? Is that your body isn't just yours. Your body belongs to the Lord. It's a gift from God. So you don't get to just do whatever you want with it because it's a gift. It's a stewardship that you have from God. Verse 19. Or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God, and that you are not your own? For you have been bought with a price. Therefore, glorify God in your body. Everything that you do in and through your body matters to God. And what God is doing for us is he's healing us spiritually, but he's also healing us spiritually in the context of our bodies. He's healing the spiritual alienation even that we feel within ourselves. So for some of you, as we, we jump into this topic we're, we're bumping up against uh, identity and sexuality. The first feeling can be one of uh, resistance and fear and shame and guilt. And I'm going to tell you that is the enemy 
holding you back from being healed. Okay, that is the enemy. The enemy comes to steal and kill and destroy. So the enemy doesn't want you to experience God's healing internally in your life and how you think about yourself. That's the enemy and you need to stop believing his lies because what God does is he redeems. What does it mean to redeem? To redeem means to buy back. So what the Lord is doing and wants to do in your life is he wants to buy back anything that someone has done to you and to your body, he can buy that back. Anything that you may have done to yourself, God can buy that back, right? He can redeem it and he can take even the most painful things that others have done to us or the most painful things that we have done to ourselves and he can buy those back and he can create beauty from ashes because that's what the creator of the universe is capable of doing, right? He can recreate the image of Jesus Christ in you and in that process bring healing to you in your spirit and in your relationship to yourself and in the rela your relationship to your body. How does he do that? He does that when every single day you wake up in the morning and you start fresh and you receive his mercies and you turn yourself over to him, your spirit and your body, the material part of you and the immaterial part of you. You put all of that in his hands and he redeems and he buys back and he heals. Listen to Paul's words. Again, Romans chapter 12. It says, therefore I urge you, brethren, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies a living and holy sacrifice, acceptable to God, which is your spiritual service of worship. Present yourself to God. Offer yourself to God. When you give yourself completely to God, body and spirit, he has access to bring healing into your life. Have you ever noticed that worship is almost always described in very physical terms? Right? Lift up your hands in praise. Bow your head. Bend your knee. In fact, the word worship in Hebrew means literally fall down. Fall down. Worship. Fall down. Guys, when you fall down, you realize, eh, I'm not really anything amazing. God is. And then God can lift you up. And Psalm chapter 8 applies. What is man that you take thought of him or the son of man that you even care for him? And yet, you've made him a little lower than God. He who humbles himself falls down, is exalted, right? You experience yourself in proper relationship to God, and then you begin to experience yourself as you are, and life begins to be reintegrated, right? Not disintegrated. And so he says, worship. Offer yourself as an act of worship so that God can heal you. And my prayer for each and every one of us, I've been praying this all week long, I've been praying this for a couple months as I've been thinking about this series, and kind of entering into it with a bit of trepidation because it's easy to misspeak. But this is a topic that we need to discuss, church, because there's so much hurt and brokenness. And this is where the Lord wants to bring healing into our lives. So where do we go from here? Um, if you really want to dig in on your own, here are a few resources. I'm going to recommend a few throughout the series that kind of apply as we go. Nancy Piercy, Love Thy Body, excellent, excellent book. She's, she's one of the best writers on worldview. Sam Alberry, What God Has to Say About Our Bodies. Now, great timing for us. Uh, Philip Bethencourt invited Sam Alberry to be speaking Saturday evening, April 20th, 6 to 8 at Central. So he's going to talk for about 45 minutes, and then he's going to take questions for about another 45 minutes. This, that'll be an excellent, excellent opportunity. Uh, he's a really good... Uh, biblicist on these topics. Then our first panel discussion will be April 24th, 7 to 9 p.m. Uh, as I mentioned before, if you want to send a question, just click on that QR code. Um, as we close, what I'd like for you to do is I'd like for you to stand with me. And I want you to read together with me in loud or soft voice the declaration of who God says that we are. Part of this healing process is that we stop believing the lies of the world and we believe what God says about who we are. So Psalm 139. It's gonna be hard for you to read that. There we go. Ready? For you formed my inward parts. You wove me in my mother's womb. I will give thanks to you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. And I'd like you to uh, bow your heads. As you bow your head and close your eyes, I'd like you to turn your palms face upward. Okay? Remember, uh, worship so often is described in very physical terms because uh, the posture of our body 
can uh, reflect what's going on in our hearts. When we're humbled, right, we, we bow. Uh, when we're proud, we lift our face up, right? So our, 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 our body posture can reflect what's going on in our hearts, but also sometimes our body posture can, can direct us. Right? We can move our bodies in such a way that it, it moves our hearts in a certain way. And so this is a, a, a Quaker prayer practice. They take their palms like this and then turn them over, face down. Turn your palms face down. And as you do so, release to the Lord shame and guilt and fear on your cares and concerns, maybe sin that's been confessed, and release that to the Lord. I'd like you to take just a moment and release all of those things to the Lord. Now turn your palms up, facing up, and receive from him grace and mercy and kindness and forgiveness. Father, I thank you that in Jesus we are freed from shame and guilt. We're freed from the debt of our sin. We're freed to, to live consistently with your design for us. And I thank you that you always want what's best for us and direct us toward life and healing and wholeness. I pray, Father, uh, as we look at your word together over the next several weeks, that we would genuinely experience healing and wholeness in our lives that Christ is made possible because he took on human flesh and suffered and died for us and you raised him from the dead. We have hope that all will be set right. Thank you for Jesus. In his name we pray, amen.